This is J.D. Lewis. I think everybody's probably met him. We certainly have mentioned his name a few times. And a great presenter and a world of information. All right, folks, hang on to your seats. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank George and Carol for having me here this weekend and letting me talk about something other than the Francis Mary stuff. But as I promised her, there, are, there was one man who claimed to be at the Battle of Kings Mountain who said he had served under Francis Mary. Now, I should have pulled out that name before I came up here, but I didn't. However, it's in here. So I also want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Because I know that there's, you've got a lot of things you could be doing under this, and I do hope that you go home with a lot of new stuff and have enjoyed your weekend. All right, so raise your hand if you've never been to the Kings Mountain National Park. All right, folks, you need to do it before you die. You've got to go do it. It is one of the nicest national parks in America. Kings Mountain itself is only a little over a quarter of a mile long, maybe less than half a mile. It's only 60 to 80 feet high. Most of it is a slope not like this, but there's a couple that are a little like this. Back during the 1780s, it did not have a lot of underbrush. If you go today, they've got a walking trail around it, and you'll see that there is a heck of a lot of underbrush. But according to most of the accounts back in 1780, there was very little, if any, underbrush. But there were a lot of trees all around, and all up and down the slope. Not a lot on top of it. So if you get a chance, get there. A couple of notes before we get started. There's probably been more books and accounts written about the Battle of Kings Mountain than any other event in South Carolina, except the Calpins and maybe Camden. So what you're going to find here is, is that the accounts are very consistent at first, but then over time they really start to diverge. And this has been very inexplicable to a lot of uh, subsequent historians. It is very drastic, and this will be explained in here. Okay, also for the record, there are only three documented ex-continental uh, officers at the battle, and only two to three ex-continental rank and file on the Patriot side. Everybody else were militia. And you know militia were just citizen soldiers. <laughs> on the opposite side, a lot of folks seem to think that we fought British regulars, or, uh, or what have you. There was only one British regular at the battle, and that was Major Patrick Ferguson. And he was ex-major from the 71st Regiment of Foot. He was handed uh, the, America, the opportunity by Sir Henry Clinton to raise a group of provincials that he named the American Volunteers. There were about 125 provincials from New York and New Jersey. The rest were loyalist militia. However, he was given several months time to get them organized and get them trained. So, we have primarily patriot militias against predominantly loyalist militia with a few ex-continentals on one side and a British regular on the other. Okay, so, let's see if we can get this working. You cannot talk about King Mountain without mentioning the, uh, the man who really kept it kept it going, got it going in his life. When he was a young boy, he went to the King's Mountain, saw the monuments, he said, Dad, why isn't everybody's name on here? Why isn't everybody's name known? So his dad told him, this is a story I've heard, I don't know if this is true, but his dad told him, maybe that's for you to do. So he made it one of his missions to do. Uh, he was a, a stalwart in South Carolina history, and he's one of my personal heroes. And I should really title this presentation on the shoulders of giants because there was Mr. Moss, Dr. Moss, and a few others that came before it that we have to acknowledge. Okay, so since my presentation goes into excruciating detail, <laughs> if you hate detail, you might as well leave now because it's coming at you hard and fast. As George said, I'm giving you every bit of the resource material that I had on this subject that's in the public domain. Now, we know there are books that have been written in the past 10 or 15, well, 50 years that are, no longer, that are not in the public domain. 
So I don't have the right to do that. You just have to go by that. We've got one of, our, one of the authors in this room. But as you can see, there are 39 publications about Kings Mountain on your disk in PDF for, format. It says 38, but there's actually 39. I found one right before I came. On the other side, you've got 604 federal pension applications. I use the term FPA, federal pension application. In 1832, uh, <coughs> militia men were authorized to apply for a federal pension. Everyone that I can prove and that Dr. Bobby Moss proved was at Kings Mountain is in here. Now, there are some pension applications that came that has references to Kings Mountain. I was near it, I rode by the day before. <laughs> Sorry, you were not at the Battle of Kings Mountain. So you have my research materials, and on the next page you've got a, an Excel spreadsheet, which is a two-tab spreadsheet. If you know about Excel, there's tabs at the bottom. We have over 1,100 documented Patriot soldiers with known sources, who they served under, and any potential disconnects. There are disconnects because history is not perfect. Uh, of those 1,100 plus, I have sourced every one except for about a dozen. A dozen I found four to five, six years ago when I was doing initial research. I haven't been able to put my hands on the source documents since, but I, know, I feel confident they were there. But of the 1,100, only a dozen, I do not have source identified. I remember getting it, but I don't have it. So let's let you know the total. There's 885 documented provincials and loyalists. And of course, they all come from Moss. So you've got that in your, your pitch. Okay. When all of you think back when you were a little kid, little girl, little boy, talking to your mama, maybe your daddy, about some really tough question that you thought you would stump them on and you did. You just felt so proud because your mama said, I guess we'll never know. <laughs> that was something special to me. I, I love to stop my mom and dad on those kind of questions when I look. The problem is I feel sorry for kids growing up today because we Google and Yahoo and all these other search engines and these telephone apps or iPhone apps or what have you, Android apps. You hardly ever hear your mom and dad say, I guess we'll never know. <laughs> because it's out there. Almost anything you can imagine is out there. The day, two days ago, I found uh, online a, a PDF book on the British side of the war, written in 1785. I didn't even know it existed until it happened to stumble across it. Bottom line is, I guess we'll never know. We'll seldom be heard for now. So with all that behind us, you got in your handout sort of an overview of what I'm gonna talk about. But as you can see, uh, sorry. There are a lot. Of, there's a lot of stuff, and there's even backed up data for those of you who just can't get enough. Uh, I'm sure there's some of you that can get enough. But we're going to talk about the commemorative events, key publications, exactly what is the problem, a harmonized chronology leading up to the battle, and then the rest of the, the story. And for the rest of the story, what I'm going to do is. I'm going to go into a group, uh, get intense here at the beginning and talk for a few minutes about get setting up the, the issue. Then I'm going to go through the middle kind of tediously quick because there's a lot of details. And then I'm going to end with a bang with here, here are the results of all the findings. So without further ado, this is not a, an eye test. <laughs> this is a quick timeline showing the key research over the past 235 years. So as you know, this year is the 235th anniversary of the Battle of King Mountain. They were going to have an event there two weeks ago, but of course we all got hit by the thousand year storm, so that one got canceled. The first accounts were within days after the battle in 1780, and they were handwritten notes sent to uh, the different governors that were at Hillsburg. Uh, Dr. Ramsey pitched, uh, presented a two-volume set just on the revolution of South Carolina 
two years after the end of the war. He then followed up later with another version, and then Moultrie released his memoirs. Uh, let's see here. Benson, this is way out here. So we're going to go across. I'm not going to talk about every one of these, but there are some key ones like Draper, which has got a star. Of course, Dr. Bobby Moss. And then we'll talk about the monuments. Uh, let's see here. We'll go. At the conclusion of the War of 1812, around 1815, Americans woke up again and decided to honor those who had fallen in all wars, including the American Revolution. So between 1780 and 1815, there were probably some local events at each battle site, and they were very small, very self-contained. Around 1815 is when the first well-known one happened in uh, Paddle Kings Mountain. Uh, let's see here. In the 1880s and 90s, the Civil War veterans sprang up, and these were dominated by the ex-enlisted men. The SAR and DAR were created in 1889 and 90, respectively, and they started urging le legislators to preserve the cemeteries and battlefield. And in 1926, the U.S. Congress finally adopted a program. So the key events for the commemoration, there are five big ones. There have been some ever since, including the bicentennial. But the key one was in 1815, Dr. William McLean had served under Green, and he decided to place the first monument. 75th anniversary, Secretary of Navy George Bancroft spoke. Preston had a great write-up. 100th anniversary, the unveiling of the U.S. monument, and then in October of 1930, President Herbert Hoover was the first sitting American president to ever visit a Revolutionary War battlefield and it was at King's Mountain. He came and he spoke. There were about 75,000 people on the side of the hill, and it was transmitted across the world by 100 radio outlets in 1930. So, going through the early accounts, you're gonna to start to see a trend here. This is written by Campbell, Shelby, and Cleveland, who went to, Cle to Hillsborough to debrief the governor and to debrief, uh, well, the two cover, as well as uh, Horatio Gates. They had a write-up. They only identified six Patriot officers, and this is just a summary of how it's deployed. There, here is the whole thing. It is, it's much longer. Uh, they even have uh, a listing of the, the uh, people that were hurt. One note, they identify nine officers, and one wasn't even there. It, but there is men were so they used the names officer this is starting to be this is the real start of where things begin to diverge moving right along dr ramsey in 85 had a two volume set he had only allocated five pages he said colonel campbell of virginia led these four men brought 910 of their best men and there were 1100 enemy that's two years after the war in 89, he revises it slightly, but he credits only one page for Kings Mountain. William Campbell now led these number, these officers, and now he said uh, they brought 1,600 men. Okay? In 1802, General William Moultrie issued his, his memoirs. He uses Ramsey's number and says, 900 men, 910 men, under these colonels, etc. This The whole thing is two volumes. It covers more than King's Mountain. It's an excellent source of material. Then in 1815, Colonel William Hill issued his memoirs. And believe it or not, folks, his set of memoirs were so biased and so anti some pro this that this was what prompted the 1815 memorial that was started at the very first time because they were objecting to some of the things that he wrote in. However, Colonel Hill offered a lot of good information that others could use. 
so you don't throw everything out. He says that there were 933 men. But when you really read through the details of what he says, these were the 933 men just under the South Carolinians. So you have to glean that by digging through his notes and other writings. So there were 910 written by Ramsey. He says 933 of only South Carolinians, and a lot of people don't pick up those distinctions. So, in result, I mentioned that the original marker was set in, in 1815 by Dr. McLean. It is so worn out, it still exists, that in 1914, they replaced it. I'm giving everybody here was what was written, here's what is written, and this is used as source material for some people. Just so you know, as you saw before, they're separate, but they really sit side, side by side. And they're right there on the side of these books. And it's, you know, very, very easy to read. Moving right along, in 1832, militiamen were authorized to submit a federal pension application. This is the first year where we have documented accounts of the, of the Revolutionary War from South Carolina and North Carolina men who had participated in his 50 years after the fact. Okay, and I think you all know Will Graves and Leon Harris for transcribing and posting these online free. There's over 20,000 for the Southern campaigns. They are transcribed and fully searchable, fully readable, and they are awesome source of material. Lossing in 1851 and 52 wrote Three volume set. He talks about six pages of the Battle of Kings Mountain. These men came with this number of men. From the cow pens, they selected 900 and went on to pursue Ferguson. 1855, John Preston, a noted historian of South Carolina, gave the address. It's about uh, 100 some, 108 pages. There you go. He says at Gilbert Town, they stopped and selected about 1,000 men of their swiftness, etc. He's got appendices with letters to and from whomever. Then in 1880, the Centennial Monument was formed. There was a group of Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina that performed an association. You will see this if you go to Kings Mountain. It's about 28 feet tall, and it has four sides that are inscribed with people who were killed, and I think some of the key women. Uh, his pamphlet, this was written by two gentlemen, Latham and Grist. They talk about these numbers of men. Now they say 1,040 men reached the foot of the mountain. Uh, mountains on September 30th. So they talk about the route, they talk what comes down, this is the first time where they add the 910 from North Carolina and Virginia, and then 933 were added from South Carolina, whereas a total of 1,843 men made it from the Patriot side. So, one of the things that always confounded me when I was doing my research was nothing that I had come up with was matching the noted historians. And it's like, wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture? So then you start challenging things, and you start digging, you start pulling threads, you start finding out things that do not add up. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the what don't add up, and then we're going to give you the answer. Okay, so 81, the big star, Lyman Draper. A lot of folks can't stand a man. A lot of folks love him. Some say that Dr. Bobby Moss did not use him very much. Others say he used Draper quite a bit. Draper did a heroic effort. His research on the Battle of Kings Mountain took over 30 years. He was in the process of writing volume two when he died. A lot of his notes are lost, some of them are kept, but the bottom line is, is that Draper didn't necessarily get a heck of a lot wrong. He just left a lot of stuff out. And that's the problem with most of the early historians. They, they have only limited sources, they have word of mouth, they have oral histories that are handed down to sons and grandsons that get passed along. That's all they can get their hands on. So they do the best that they can. So this is not a slam on anybody. 
None. It's, it is to praise them for their work and acknowledge it and then realize that new stuff comes along. So again, Draper uses the 900, oops, wrong button, 910 that came from Ramsey. He identifies a few more men that nobody else had answered, but of course the key ones. Then he comes up with a conclusion that the loyalty provincials had about 1,120 men. This is all in 1880. And oh, by the way, Draper was from Wisconsin, not from South Carolina or North Carolina. Interesting, too. Uh, 1891 is the next key. There were a couple of other events written, uh, and there it is written, but this is, these are key ones. Uh, David Vance and Robert Henry uh, wrote their, their information. This one was written in 1799 and passed down. I don't know when this one was written, but they both had said Ferguson had 120 men. Uh, 1897, this is the Tennessee Centennial Exhibition. A few more, more uh, numbers that, are, that add up that agree. 1909, this monument was added. Uh, the event was arranged by local PAR. 8,000 people attended, plus the governors of all four states. This obelisk is 83 feet tall. It is a beautiful monument. <coughs> there are four plaques around it, and the four plaques have got these transcriptions. They mostly talk about, uh, here are the forces and who led them. Only a couple of errors here, not a lot. Some who were killed, oh, uh, the end. they couldn't name them all. They tried to run, get them all. Morally wounded and wounded. One note, there is a lieutenant colonel that's listed as morally wounded who didn't have scratch on him. So the monument is just going to be that way forever. All right, so now 24, Kathy Keogh White has a, a, a count that is mostly about the Tennesseans. A little bit about the Virginians. Uh, big biography on John Sevier. Letters to and from Draper. A handful of rosters. Some noted loyalists. And some personal sketches of many soldiers. The only problem with her personal sketches of soldiers, you don't know whether she's writing about they really fought at the battle or they may have. She wasn't very clear on that. But it's an excellent book for, for some sources. Next we have the... U.S. Army War College, 1928, two years after the feds took over the battlefield, they commissioned the U.S. Army War College to do a complete study on the Battle of uh, Kings Mountain. They come up with these numbers. They add a few names that we've not seen before, but they do their layout of who was where, and there are names associated, A, B, C, D, and you find out that the map provided is almost backwards to everybody else's analysis. And when you go to reading and trying to figure out why is the deployment 180 degrees out of sync with everybody else, you realize that the military guys doing this research thought the Patriots came in through this primary road and turned and then deployed. When the truth was a matter of what, they came down this little road and turned left and deployed. So when you find that out, new details, they call it Everest in the World, and a full bird colonel in the Army got canned for making such an egregious error on his deployment. So here we have Hoover's uh, address, 75,000 people sitting on the sides of the mountain. There were pamphlets handed out. This is a picture of him at the actual address. You can see the South Carolina flags. These pamphlets can be found online. So you know what was said, who did it. Okay, in 1932, there were three monuments. No, two monuments had it. This is the new one for William Chronicle. It was erected by the William Chronicle chapter of the DAR. There's the inscription. And then they talked, they added a new Ferguson monument. That there had been one before, but it had crumbled, so they added this one back, and it stands to this day. In 1931, there were three more monuments added. Hoover, they call this the Hoover Monument because he came and spoke. He was the first president who ever addressed. Uh, Colonel Ashbury Coward was a president of the Kings Mountain Centennial in 1880. 
So they're honoring him. Not a whole lot of Kings Mountain information. Then Hambright in 1931, the DAR from <coughs> Hambright chapter added this one. FYI, he was a lieutenant colonel. He was a, a German descent, and he had very broken English. We're going to talk a little bit more about him in a few minutes. Then the last monument that I've been able to find is called the Hawthorne Monument in 1949. This is Lieutenant Colonel James Hawthorne. Yay, they got the rank right. And everybody who knows me knows that I hate the rank of Lieutenant Colonel because it's just in the Revolution, you were a Colonel, you were a Colonel, you were a Colonel, whether you were a Lieutenant Colonel or a full Colonel. And most people got it wrong. But I don't know a whole lot about this. I found very little information about why this was added in 49 except that. Yeah, they wanted to honor him. So at the bicentennial celebration, this is all the information that I could dig out. Jimmy Carter was invited to speak. I don't know whether he did or not. Maybe some of you were here and know whether he did or didn't. There were also the governors of the North and South Carolina <coughs> invited to meet. I don't know whether they made it or not. We're getting closer to the end of this. So of course, Dr. Moss produced his first book in 1990. He says 875 men were definitely, almost definitely in the battle, and he gives him an alphabetical order and identifies which units if he can. He says there are additional 1,200 men who were possibly in the battle. Then he lists about 80 men who were definitely, most likely not in the battle. He used the pension applications, except he didn't have the benefit of Will and Leon's transcript. He wrote, read the poor handwritten thousands of them. He used bounty land warrants, audited accounts, muster rolls, plus other reliable sources. Finally, he is the noted expert on the loyalists. He identified 885 <coughs> confirmed and 50 men who were probably. He used these sources. So, what exactly is the problem? I'll look at our clock here. All right, so here's the, sub, here's the issue as I found it. The number of men not in close to previous histories and not what I came up with. Now, nobody used regiment names in any of the previous history. Few agree on who served under who. And the deployment at Kings Mountain is not even close. All right, there are a lot of discrepancies. A lot of them seem to pick a version and stick with it, but little new analysis. That's not 100% true, but it's mostly true. There's a few of that new analysis. Taking quickly, uh, in the group that was, that was met to elect William Campbell on October 4th in Gilbert Town sent a letter with Charles McDowell to go to uh, Gates, sent us a general officer to lead this, said they had 1,500 good men, and they were expecting 1,000 more from South Carolina and Colonel Williams. That's the write-up. Uh, an unknown account under Colonel William Campbell says, these numbers comes up to 1,300. Uh, Colonel Isaac Shelby was governor of Kentucky. He was running again in 1814. So he comes up with a slightly different set of regiments, or colonel's name, but they're not the same as he came up with in 20, 30 years earlier. For some reason, he decided to take this opportunity to downplay Campbell's leadership, and it really ticked off a lot of people. But, Anyway, needless to say, Allaire was a uh, provincial, said 2,500 patriots and 800 on his side. The regiments identified here in the original write-up who came up with these number of, of units. Let's see here. Oh, Major Samuel Tate came into the camp of Brigadier General William Lee Davidson of North Carolina and gave him an account of the battle. He was the brigade major to Sumter, but he was at the battle. He says that they selected 1,600 good horse. And Ferguson had about 1,400 men. So this is days after. This is a brigade major. Why would he make up numbers? All right, so quick recap. This is what Draper came up with, and he didn't even acknowledges all these. But then he throws in the Brigadier General letter, uh, William Lee letter, saying this has definitely got to be an exaggeration. 
<laughs> the only org chart I've ever seen other than my own was produced by this gentleman, Dallin, in 2003. He calls them the Overmountain Men were these guys, the rest were these guys, and they had 910 men. So that's it. Let's see here. From the 1880 pamphlet, it said 933 plus 910 equals 1843. He names 14 regiments, but they're not correctly named. For Will Graves, excellent book. Heck of a lot better breakdown. You see now there's a lot more units being described. But again, the numbers are what I call a little bit on the light side, but it's much better than anything we've seen before. So you start looking at the analysis, you find out who said who was there. No, no, yes, yes, no, no. Uh, all these were included, 2,500. This guy, Hawthorne, was under Brandon. Uh, little things like that, that's kind of under Brandon. Uh, anyway, bottom line, you see everything from 875 to 2,500. And that's just in a synopsis. Draper shows the deployment as Shelby here, Williams here, Lacey, you can read yourself. Uh, this is his version in 81, 1881. And he identifies everybody by colonel's name. I just gave you the clarification of what who the colonel were. That's what the mountain looks like. It kind of looks like a paramecium. Like I said, it's only about a quarter of a mile, third of a mile long. It's only about 60 to 80 feet high. There were trees all around this, but Draper and myself had to get rid of these trees because we needed to write any there. <laughs> okay, so then you start seeing other de deployments from the National Park Service, they only list these names, and no, they don't even mention James Williams. For this guy, Thomas Legion, he comes up with a totally different set of nine units, and there's no chronicle of all part. You look at Cornwallis, the American Adventure, a little bit different. Again, Profile of a Patriot, which is a very good book from Colonel Benjamin Cleveland. Different deployment, and you say, does this really matter? Again, this was the U.S. Army, which was totally backwards, and there's probably a dozen more online, and they're just totally off the map. So, you look at deployments, is this important? He says four columns, left, left center, right, right wing, left, left center, right, right wing. Three columns, left, left, right, right, there's, there's going to be more, these are the different books that I talked about. The pinching guys, they said, Left was Shelby Cleveland Campbell, Cleveland Shelby Campbell, didn't know, Cleveland Shelby Severett Campbell, totally different stuff. There's three more here. They talk about, uh, we left the horses uh, in view of the enemy. One source says we left the horses a hundred, uh, half a mile back, and the different sources, etc. We dismounted at the ravine just north. So you can read all of this in the CD that you're gonna get. That's why I'm going real quick. For the routes, Everybody seemed to talk about, about the routes from the Virginians and the Over Mountain Men. Guess what, guys? Over Mountain Men was not used at that time. They were just called the Mountain Men. And the units were from North Carolina and Virginia. They knew it. Everybody knew it. When you read most of the summaries of the history, that was the Over Mountain Men won the Battle of King Mountain with a little help from North Carolina and South Carolina. The Over Mountain Men were just a subset. Mostly North Carolinians, but a lot of South Carolinians. Okay, taking a look at the routes again, there's a lot left off, but of course, John Robertson and Bill Anderson give us the best view. I know it's hard to read, but you can see it on your CD. They show Cleveland coming from here, uh, the over mountain men coming this way, and they show some of the movement of Ferguson. So, they're worth all this other, they're worth a lot, but they're incomplete. There's probably a lot of errors and omissions, but there's no excuse to keep propagating these old errors. So, you know, it's like, okay, it's time to get ourselves worked up on getting those things a more accurate. I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but this did harmonize the chronology. We start with Fishing Creek and Musgrove's Mill. Thomas Sumter got whooped. He took a lot of men north with him and camped at Charlotte. Uh, Shelby led at Musgrove's Mill, but there were South Carolina Georgia militia. They knew 
instantly that Ferguson was sent to come after them. So they all but They all went north. And of course, Williams escorted most of the prisoners to Hillsborough because he wanted to talk to Governor Abner Nash about, hey, can I get some men from Castle County? We all know about that. This is his letter from Ash to Williams, giving him authorization. On the 12th of September, is about the King Key, King Creek in Burke County, uh, Charles McDowell versus Ferguson. Uh, they, Patriots got whooped right here, sorry, right here. They decided it's time to go across the mountains and rethink this. Ferguson started to follow him. In fact, he had been ordered, go across the mountains and do what you gotta do. But once he got about here, he realized, man, I don't have a lot of support, so I better get my butt back down this way. So he went back to go down. Uh, let's see, this is Davidson. Not a whole lot. Part of what I concerned about was why weren't some others there? Sumner had a group in Salisbury. Uh, Williams made it to Salisbury on the 20th. Let's see. Samuel Hammond says that he was authorized by Governor Rutledge to take over uh, the, the South 96th District Brigade that was in North Carolina. So go get men at Higgins, actually Huggins plantation, but he wrote Higgins. A lot of folks think that James William was there with him, but I'm convinced that William was still in Salisbury, so they were not together. As we all know, Cornwallis entered Charlotte on the 26th. Uh, the, the North Carolina Virginia guys left Watauga to go looking. Colonel William leaves Salisbury on the 28th. Brandon met with William. Brandon met with William back here, so I'm just up. Anyway, as we all know, South Carolina had a military organization with real regiment names and real leaders. The ones with the star are the ones that were heading towards Kings Mountain. The ones with triangles were detachments heading to Kings Mountain. And as you see, Colonel Francis Mary was doing his thing on this side of the state. North Carolina had 51 regiments and six brigades of militia, plus some continentals and state troops. These are the folks that were heading towards Kings Mountain with the detachments. Uh, let's see. There. October 2, a lot of folks <coughs> met up with. And there's his letter showing that he had about uh, 13, 1,500 men and 800 men from uh, Cleveland. October 2nd, Hambright, I'm going to go through all this. Harmonize says by October 6th, they were at the Calcans and October 7th, oh, at October 7th. Hill was sick, so he stayed at the Calcans, we all know that. He handed it over to Hawthorne. William Graham is escorted home. Some say that it was his wife that was in bad state. Some say it was him. Uh, some say that uh, he heard the shooting, so he was escorted back. I don't know whether he made it back in time or not. But McDowell was riding to Hillsboro, so Joseph McDowell took over his unit. So that's it. The rest of the story is boom, ta da. Why did the other units? The units identified come together in a near perfect storm. Why were other units not there? Why were the numbers so, so different? How did 900 Patriots defeat over 1,125 provincials and loyalists? So, to get real answers, you've got to dig into thousands of details. Note one almost all officers had good horses. <coughs> a lot of people forget that there. Yeah. It turns out there are 53 field officers on the Patriot side in this battle, they had horses. It also turns out there were 350 company level officers, captains and lieutenants at this battle. That makes 400 Patriot officers at the battle because they all had horses. Now, you're going to find that most of the units described were actually light horse units. So it's like, <laughs> how do we come up with our numbers? So what you're going to find is, is that majors led as few as two captains. And most captains had an average of about five. Some had more, and you're going to see that here. Note two, we had well-established and well-known regiments, and they all agreed to work together for a common good. 
but we can do better. Well, this is where we get back to now asking mom the question. And the answer now is again, I guess we'll never know because there's just too much water under the dam. But there's, there's the actual deployment. 14 known regiments, 14 detachments of other regiments, a total of 234 companies, four, a documented number of 1,127 men. Now, my guesstimate is the Patriots had closer to 1,661, and it's in detail. These men basically got around the mountain, worked on their own, same here. Same here. Some say that Clark was under Williams, but everything I find, he worked right beside Shelby. James Williams, oh, there's James Williams. He had these field officers under him, plus these companies from the different uh, counties he rode through. Brandon served under him. Robach served under him. Watson served under him. Robert Anderson served under him. All these men were folded into what they call uh, Williams is 450, but nobody seems to want to give him credit for being there. Joseph McDowell had most of these men with him at King Creek. They went across the mountain and came back together, but there are a few stragglers that ended up latching onto him on the way back down the mountain. So, what's the route? There's the route that we all know and love for the over mountain men, thanks to these gentlemen. There is no way I could have routed all the other 20-some regiments and how they came. But they came as far as Chatham County up to here, from Granville County up to here. They came across here, down to Salisbury, down this way. They came from Surrey County, across to Wilkes County, down to here. And then the mounted men came this way. South Carolinians came up here and here. Uh, some of them were there before. So, making a quick stop. The South Carolina officers that went to North Carolina after Fishing Creek and Musgrosville, Sumter, John Thomas Jr., Lieutenant Colonel Charles Middleton, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Hampton, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Wynn. My guess is William Bratton was one of those also. Those were the officers that were with Sumter and Charlotte, and they rode with him to Hillsborough to convince uh, Rutledge to give him command. Then there was James William, Thomas Brandon, William Hill, Lacey, Roebuck, Hawthorne, Major Samuel Ham Hammond. So 15 key South Carolina officers were in North Carolina already because of Fishing Creek and Musgrove's Mill. How many men they had with them is another story. And I can't nail all that down. So later historians essentially lumped them all together, those 15 South Carolina officers, and say they were South Carolina refugees, and there's nothing else to say about it, but we know that they have, they had true regiments. So there are the names of all of the attachments, all of the regiments and where they came from. So now you see, oh, this is a, a high test. This is a different version of how to show deployments and routes. This is what they call a water diagram used in a lot of industries. But essentially, these guys looked up, he leaked up here, these guys joined here, they went to these locations, and they're marching on their way. Two sources say that, that uh, 